Hi everyone, my name is Jade Dickinson. I'm a software engineer at Simply Business. We have offices here in, uh, in London and here in Boston. So I've worked pretty extensively with Elm. And earlier this year, when I was starting at Simply Business, I got ex start, excited to start learning React with Redux. I was talking with a friend about this, and I said, well, I suppose my Elm knowledge isn't going to be much use here. When he said that actually understanding Elm would be quite helpful for learning React with Redux, I was intrigued, and I started to look into that more. This talk is the result of that curiosity. So to give a bit of background, Elm is a functional language that compiles to JavaScript. Like React, it's used for building applications for the browser. Similarly, it's used when starting to introduce serious logic to your web app. Web apps all need to manage application state, for example, whether an option is selected or not. You could manage this without a framework, for example, by adding classes to individual DOM elements and reading them later. But as your app grows, this will become difficult to manage. React, Redux, and Elm all have their own ways of addressing this need. So to avoid storing state in individual child components, in React, you hold your state in a top-level component and then pass that data down through to child components. This is the component state paradigm, and it may be fine in a small application where you've got a few levels in your DOM tree. Uh, Redux solves this by providing a global state that any component in the tree can use and trigger changes to. Quoting from Redux's three principles, in Redux, the state of your whole application is stored in an object tree within a single store. So you store application state outside the DOM in the state, and components interact with that to read or to update state. In Elm, you use the Elm architecture, which is a built-in architecture for data flow. It handles data flow in web applications by centralizing application state into one data structure called the model. So these are quite similar. Why is that? Well, Redux was actually inspired by the Elm architecture. I have a citation for that there. But it's not exactly the same, and we're going to get into that a bit more later. So both Redux and the Elm architecture are for avoiding storing application state in components. Let's look at how they do that. So both Redux and Elm define all the ways data can flow through your code. Redux in reducers and Elm in its update function. This makes it clear how data flows through applications. So in Elm, the pattern of data flow is model, view, update. You start by initializing your model with the values you want it to hold. The model holds one-to-many values that can be of different types. Practically, it looks a little bit like a JavaScript object or a Ruby hash, and this will be where you could keep all the information you want to track in your app. Redux's equivalent is the state, bundled up within the store as an internal variable, which you can only interact with through functions. So how does the data flow through your application work? You set up the initial state of your application, but you're not going to stop there. What happens when you want that state to change? So something I noticed when I started learning about Redux was that the diagrams that you see to represent Elm and Redux look somewhat similar. So here's one for Elm, and below here's one for Redux. So you can see in Redux you've got your store, and in Elm you've got your model. Redux's store doesn't just contain the application state, but wraps that up as the state, along with ways of interacting with that data through functions. The fact that all of the data in your application state is held in one place was familiar to me, but the Elm model really only represents your application state. Um, in both cases, the information held in the initial model or the initial state is rendered in the view on first load. So you've got your view, and it's visible to the user. What happens next? Say you've got a form. The user will want to interact with that in some way, like filling in their details and submitting it. In Elm, when parts of the view function associated with user input are interacted with, they will trigger messages. So say your user has clicked on a button in the view, the message specified there will be triggered. These messages are handled by a centralized update function, which takes the message it receives and the current model, does some work, and returns a resulting model. From there, you go back around again. So Redux actions are analogous to messages in Elm. Um, then in the place of the Elm update function, Redux has a reducer function. There's sort of an additional layer of indirection in Redux, the dispatch function. Um, this felt a little bit different to me, as in Elm, messages are picked up directly by the update function, and you don't have to connect these up manually. So, reducers and update functions. 
you define all the ways data can flow through the code in the Elm update function and in Redux reducers. I, I just sort of wanted to show you how similar reducers are to update functions because this was something that really stood out to me when I started learning about Redux. So here on the left, this is the Elm update function for a simple counter. And I've taken a small bit of Redux code for the same kind of application. So side by side, on both sides, if the message or the action type is of increment, then modify the count in the model or the state by increasing it by one. And the same, but in reverse for decrementing. Then the state or the model is returned. So I talked about handling synchronous events with update or reducer functions. That's all good for handling synchronous events within your application, but what about asynchronous events? So in Elm, there's one accepted approach for asynchronous events, like making API requests. In the Elm guide, there's a section which in short says, okay, so you want to interact with the world outside of Elm, here's what you should need to use. Um, in Redux, there's no one way to handle these. So there's a section I read in the Redux docs about what tools you should choose for async. It says that funks are only good for simple asynchronous logic, and sagas are good for complex asynchronous logic, and then it says observables do the same thing as sagas, but there's no like indication as to which you should pick. So from my perspective, coming to React and Redux from Elm, this is kind of overwhelming. You have this wealth of options, and you have to decide what's best for you. It's at this point where you start to see how having one standard approach can make for a really nice developer experience. In Elm, you just don't have to make any decisions of this sort. So we saw earlier that Redux was inspired by the Elm architecture, but it's very much distinct. What if you could take that same model view update approach that's core to the Elm architecture? So as it turns out, you can. There's this awesome library called Redux Loop, which you can use for handling effects in Redux. Uh, it's a port of the Elm architecture to Redux, um, and so the commands that you see in Elm it allows you to use this exact same pattern in Redux. So trade-offs. I've seen pros and cons when using either Elm or React. So the best bit about writing Elm code as, a, as an engineer is that if your code compiles, you won't have any JavaScript type errors in production. Elm just really does not let you make these kinds of mistakes. The compiler catches these sort of errors up front and will make you fix them. And your code won't compile until you do which means you get the safety of knowing you've covered all the cases you can possibly get. Um, when it comes to learning, I think, as far as I can tell, there are a lot more resources for learning React. So in my experience, the best way of learning Elm, if you're interested in trying it out, is not through tutorials, but through a lot of practice. Um, and then I've also tried teaching Elm to some friends, and I found that go having them go through tutorials which use scaffolding, this is a concept which is sort of where you have to fill in the blanks in pre-written exercises, like the one on this slide, that seems to be really effective. Um, interestingly, uh, then I noticed that for people learning, the compiler actually helps with the learning process. So when someone makes a mistake, the code won't compile, but the Elm compiler gives really clear and very friendly error messages with a hint about what to fix for the developer. So the smallest example um, would be you're trying to concatenate two strings, but you're using the wrong operator in Elm. So the error message would read, the left argument of plus is causing a type mismatch. Plus is expecting the left argument to be a number, but the left argument is a string. One thing that differs quite a lot when, is where you can look for help when you're stuck. So with React, you'd be fine reaching for Stack Overflow. There's over 150,000 React questions, and just for Redux, there's 20,000 the last time I checked. But Elm has a very small footprint here. There's only around 1,500 questions so far. Um, for Elm, you should actually ask questions in the Elm Slack, where people are very happy to help out. So on the one hand, this means that you get an answer faster, maybe, but it also means that you cannot find the last time someone asked the same question as you and read what answers they got. Um, Otherwise, I've also found that in the Elm community, people are very friendly. So you go along to meetups, and everyone's happy to talk about what they're working on, help each other learn, and talk about what's upcoming in the language. So that's really nice. Uh, if you want to try out Redux Loop, there's a link at the top here. And if you're interested in playing around with Elm, these are my favorite resources for getting started. Uh, there's also an Elm meetup here in Boston. Thank you very much. Uh, please feel, come free, feel free to come talk to me afterwards if you have any questions.